Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another glorious day. It's a day that we're alive and that we uh, have an opportunity to come and worship you. We thank you that you have called us. We have heard your voice and we've gathered from all parts of the world. We claim your promise that your spirit, your presence would be amongst us. We pray for um, enlightenment, for understanding. We pray for an understanding of your character that um, we so much need at the end of the world. We pray for that increase of knowledge that you've promised your movement and we know that it is here and we just ask for um, an increase of understanding. We pray for our brothers and sisters across the world, those that are struggling, those that are sick. Uh, we sp ask especially for our Colner family in Winchelsea today that you would bless them in a special way. But all those, Father, that are, aren't well, may you be with them and um, may they know your presence. So as we handle these sacred topics, we do pray for that um, reverence of heart and mind. We, we realise, Lord, that you are opening up your character to us and we will not be satisfied until we awake with your likeness. Whatever it is that we need to put aside, wh whatever idols are there in our heart, we want to fully surrender that to you this morning. Teach us, mould us in your image, glorify your name is our, our, our prayer this morning. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, we're going to begin our study this morning with uh, another children's story. You remember last week I told you of an experience I had many years ago when um, I was doing some work. We were working with a group of people. We were fencing and, and, uh, and tree planting. Uh, helping the farmers with their problems with erosion. And I got stuck in the middle of a mob of sheep. And it was an awakening for me because I used to think that all sheep were the same. Seen one sheep, seen them all. And it was a real revelation because as I stood there in that mob of sheep, I realised that all sheep were not the same. There were many different sheep. They all had different faces different expressions, different shapes of their faces. They all looked very much the individual. And that really surprised me. We were talking about how our mind likes to do shortcuts. How if we can just um, not have to think too hard and too slow on everything, it makes life a bit easier. But sometimes that can be a dangerous thing. And especially when we like to group things together, like sheep. We say all oh, sheep are the same. We could do that with people and that's not a very good thing to do. So even though people might belong to one country, doesn't mean they're all the same. Or though they might have all the same skin color, they can be very diverse. Some people might all belong to one religion and we would call them sheep because they're all following one leader and we'd say that that makes them stupid. But what did Jesus say? He called his people sheep. And that doesn't mean we're stupid. So we had a good look at sheep. We saw that they're very intelligent, have great memories, that they're very um, emotional. They love being smiled at. They don't like being frowned at. But they're just as intelligent as cattle and almost as intelligent as pigs. Pigs are very intelligent. What I want to talk about today is their eyes. So here's some pictures of some different eyes of different animals. Can you tell which eye belongs to a sheep? You're right. It's the eye that is slanted horizontally. Now the eye that's directly underneath it is the eye of a what do you think that is? It's actually the eye of a cat. And you can see that their pupil is slanted vertically. Now what's the difference? A sheep has very very good eyesight. Its eyes are on the side of its head and the pupils are slanted which means it can almost see right round its body, not quite. Nearly has 360 degree peripheral vision, that's what we call it. 
can't quite see all the way around, but nearly. And the sheep of the cat, or it would be of any, uh, this is the picture of a cat, it can see really good just straight in front of it. Now, why would that be necessary? What's the difference between these two animals? A sheep is a, um, is a prey animal. It's an animal that gets preyed on. It can be in very dangerous situations. So it needs to see all the way around it. So the minute you walk into its paddock, it knows you're there and it knows what color you are, what you're wearing. It, 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 can, it can sense that you're there even from a distance away. It might not see you 100% clearly, but it knows you're there. And that's very good for if you're a, an animal that can get preyed on. Whereas the animal that's got the vertical pupils, it's a predator. So it just needs to focus on what's in front of it. Now, Jesus said that we're sheep. So we need to have that vision that sees all the way around us to understand our environment and what the dangers are. But the sheep do have a blind spot. Right at the back of their head, there's a spot and where they can't see and they can't see it when they put their head up in the air. They put their head up, then they get a blind spot and that's when you can jump on the sheep. So if we're sheep, because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, we hear the voice of Jesus and we follow him, where's our blind spot? When we lift our heads up, when we think we're better than anybody else, it creates a blind spot. And that's when the enemy can get, come in and get us. We have to have our head down. We need humility. And then with our eyes on the side of our heads, with our peripheral vision, we can see all the way around us. So there's many things about a sheep that are very, very interesting. And that's just another one. Sheep are like goats too. They have similar eyes where they need to see everything that's in their environment. And we're the same. That's why we look at world events. We look at what's happening in the church and what's happening out in the world because we're to be aware of everything that's happening around us. We're not prey, uh, predator animals, just focused on one thing. So that's another thing about sheep. So we must never look at people or anything as being um, all the same. God's creation is very diverse, whether it's in the animal kingdom or in the human world. We don't put people all in one box, just like we don't put animals all in one box. So that's our lesson for today and see if you can see um, what the relevance is to the study today as we continue to study on. So thank you for the children for listening. So we're going to start our main study now. If you were to ask somebody in the movement what they thought of the civil rights movement back in the 1950s, what do you think their reaction would be? What would be our standard response? We'd like to think that if we, all things being equal, we went back into that time, into the 1950s, we'd be standing right there with our brothers and sisters fighting for equality, that we'd see the issues clearly. And we have no trouble today looking back on the 1950s and seeing what those issues were and seeing right from wrong. We would support that civil rights movement. Come forward one decade into the 1960s, and it's the feminist movement. What is our um, perception of that movement today? Do we look on the feminist movement of the 1960s as the same way we look on the civil rights movement of the 1950s? And we would like to think we would, but it's, we tend to struggle a bit when we, when we just come forward one decade. We don't quite look at it with the same eyesight. Would we have called ourselves feminists, whether we were male or female? So even if we'd say yes, there tends to be a little bit of discomfort, unsettling with that thought. And why is that? What does 10 years difference make? And it's because we've had trouble getting rid of our Protestant mindset. It's deeply ingrained in us. 
the, the Protestant thinking, the, the um, standard uh, evangelical thought. We're just going to do a quick review of um, of the study of the Apis bull. That's not too high. If we go back to the 70 year captivity, 70 years captivity, they were in captive to literal Babylon. 608 BC to 538. BC and um, if you say 609 or 539 I won't argue with you so before that God's people they worshipped literal idols namely the apis bull among others but it was their chief idol that 70 year captivity where they were um, put into the hands of the Babylonians for that period of time, where they were immersed in the idolatry, it cured them of idolatry. So when they came out the other end, they came out in three decrees. By the time you get to the third decree, 457 BC, what did that third decree allow them to do? So the first and the second was to go back and rebuild the temple. When they rebuilt the temple, there were no idols. And then 457, they were allowed some autonomy of government. They could rule themselves to a certain degree. To, uh, de de degree. They had some autonomy and they had their own laws, their own government, even though they were still under the control of the Medes and Persians. But they had law. And now they've got no idols, no literal idols, literal. But we understand that they, that was only in form. They never got rid of the spirit of those idols. So these idols represented what? Powerful, a powerful uh, god, a, a god of war, a, a male patriarchal god. And so when, once they came out of captivity, they still had that idea of God in their mind. They might not have fashioned him after a bull, but he was still what that bull represented. We come down to the other period of captivity, the 1260 years. And now they're in captivity to spiritual Babylon. What was it that 538 AD to 1798? What was it that the God's people had wrong prior to this captivity? They were worshipping on Sunday. They had begun worshipping on Sunday. 1260 years of being immersed in the wine of Babylon that when they come out the other end, they're prepared to get rid of the, that Babylonian idol, that spiritual Babylon. They're in spiritual Babylon to the mother, captivity to the mother. So when they come out 46 years to build the temple and then in 1844, they've got law and now no Sunday. Now it's the Sabbath. And so we come down to our time. We realise that the Church of God went into a later seen condition. They again go into captivity for 126 years. To who? Spiritual Babylon. But this time to the daughters. So 
So what was it leading up to that time, 1863, in captivity to 1989, when God is going to bring them out and start reforming them? What is it that they held on to here, that they have to be fully immersed in here so that they can get rid of? This kind of reminds me of the Cadbury factory in, in Tasmania, the chocolate factory in Tasmania. When you go there and you start to work at it, they say, eat all the chocolate you want. You can have as much chocolate as you want. And they know that after a couple of days, you're, not, you're gonna hate the side of chocolate and you won't eat any more. And this is kind of what's happened here. You get immersed in this wine of Babylon that at the end you see the result of it doesn't make you feel very good. So you need to get rid of these, whatever this idol is, whatever this false doctrine is. So leading up to 1863, that, that is some, that, that the mindset that pr the Protestants had then is, the, is what the church goes into captivity to during this time period and it has to come out of or be reformed from at the end of that. I'm going to write 2014 here because in 2014 we begin to be organised just like the church was here reformed. So we want to understand what was it we had to get rid of here or, or what we've carried through this time period that has to be um, dealt with here. And as we've studied on there's been a number of things. Let's list some of these things that we've had wrong, that we've inherited from spiritual Babylon, from the daughters of spiritual Babylon, the Protestant churches. Globalism. With that, an, a wrong understanding of the United Nations. Um, all right, vaccines. Feminism. Um, We'll just write conspiracy theories because there's many of them. Uh, the idea of a Judeo-Christian West. That needs to have a Christian uh, uh, government. Christian morality and government. Uh, the idea of um, uh, capitalism versus socialism. And we could probably add to the list. When we think of conspiracy theories, there's a lot involved there. So if we look back at these lines, we see that um, the problem with literal idols is a problem with understanding law. Namely, I guess, the first and the second law. Don't make any um, graven images. So the law has to be understood here, but at a spiritual um, level, because they, they did away with the form but they kept the spirit of the idol worship. Therefore, they didn't keep the law in its spirit. When we come down here, Sunday, that's the law as well. That's number four, commandment number four. When we come down here, we could add all these up. If there was one law that, um, if you broke all of these problems down into one law, which would it be? Now, usually we, we would say, well, it represents the last six. And especially if you go down into this time period, we think of the last six commandments about how we re relate to our fellow man and how that um, led up to the civil war and the, um, uh, the attitude of Protestants to um, 
their, um, to, to slavery. So we think of the last six commandments, but I'm thinking of one commandment in particular. If we broke this down, which commandment really does it come boil down to? And I want to suggest it's number nine. Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbour. Now, who is your neighbour? Your neighbour just means another person. You cannot bear false witness against another person. That means you, we need, we're not only commanded to not bear false witness, that means we also must have a true witness of other people. We should have an understanding of the world around us and the people around us so that we do not bear false witness of them. In each of these things, whether we're um, against science, against governments, against doctors, we bear false witness of people and conspiracy theories, you know, whether it's Bill Gates, um, you know, we cannot afford to be bearing a, a false witness of those people. Down here, we bore false witness of our brothers. Just because they had a different skin colour, they were thought to be inferior. That is a false witness. And so these, this is this commandment that has to be understood as we come to the, as we come, it, we came into our time period. We are to accurately, accurately represent those around us. We cannot and should not falsely, intentionally or unintentionally represent people that are around us. So that is why one of the reasons last week we took a look at the people of Islam, at Muslims and the history surrounding uh, Muslims and Muhammad. We understand that uh, Islam is a subject of Bible prophecy and that there is a lot of Islamophobia at the end of the world. So we need to have a correct understanding of Muslims and Islam so that we do not bear false witness. The study that I did last week and that I will be revising today is not intended to do away with our prophetic understanding of, uh, of uh, Islam in Bible prophecy, whether it's the three woes or the fifth and sixth and seventh trumpet and the third woe and 9-11, it's not meant to do away with any of that. All this is intended to do is to open our eyes to our neighbours and to have a right understanding of them so that we can represent them and not bear, correctly and not bear a false witness. So when we, when we are in ignorance of people, intentionally or unintentionally, it breeds fear. And this is what uh, Donald Trump um, works on. He breeds fear in people against minorities and against uh, uh, different religions and different colour and uh, it's different nations. The idea is to keep people in ignorance. And so in order to come out of ignorance, you just need knowledge. Go back and with peripheral vi vision, have a look at the whole situation, understand things in their historical context so that we can have a right understanding. So it's this fear. Ignorance lives, le leads to fear. Fear leads to having a wrong attitude towards all these things, especially conspiracy theories. It's the Protestant world, apostate Protestantism, that creates a lot of this fear, created fear that back in this time period. And... Um, it's their worldview that dehumanises people. So, um, so part of the, the purpose of this is to stop that dehumanisation of any group of people, but in particular Muslims. So um, again, the purpose of this study is to, uh, to challenge Islamophobia. So uh, I'm just. So we had a presidential debate 
on the, I think it was the 30th of September. And it'll go down in history for a lot of different reasons. It was, um, it was a bit difficult to watch. It was on, yes, September 30. And um, one of the things that the commentators took note of is what didn't, um, sometimes what is not spoken of speaks louder than what is spoken of. And it was interesting in that debate that the word terrorism never came up once. They barely touched the, the, the issues of national security or of um, uh, foreign policy. Mostly what they talked about was the virus, of course, and racial justice. So they were the two issues but foreign policy, national security, which is very, very different from the uh, debates, say, in uh, 2016. So uh, Pew Survey did uh, uh, surveys back in that time, and then the most, uh, the second greatest issue on people's minds back in 2016 was Islamic terrorism. But in 2020, it didn't even make the list. Very different from, from the last presidential debates for, oh, since, since 2000. So, so what changed? President Trump has tried to make an enemy of China because you've got to have an enemy. You've got to divert attention to someone, some bad person. But largely, uh, Islam has kind of gone off the radar. We know as students of Bible prophecy that it hasn't that it's still very real and there's a lot of things happening in the world today that aren't necessarily to do with US politics. So they're still very much a force and uh, we will see um, that come up more in, in Bible prophecy. But certainly it didn't register in these, this last election. So what we wanna do is go back and have a look at the history of Islam. So we're gonna go to Genesis 16 If you turn in your Bibles to Genesis 16, and we'll just read our familiar verses on the historical beginnings of um, the Muslim people. So Genesis 16, and it's the story of Hagar. So Sarah couldn't bear a ch child, so she suggested that Abraham sleep with her handmaid, sleep with a slave. And uh, Hagar had, had, was um, uh, a pregnant with Abram's child and giving Sarah a bit of lip. So Sarah asks if she can send Hagar away. So let's jump into verse 9. We can start at verse 7. And the angel of the Lord found her, that is Hagar, by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. So the first thing we want to note here is that the angel of the Lord appears to this slave woman. And we understand that angel of the Lord is no less a person than Jesus Christ. He takes the time to come and talk to this uh, frightened uh, uh, woman. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. So again, the angel of the Lord spake, the angel of the Lord spake. God took the time to speak to Hagar. And this is the very first time in Bible, uh, in the Bible narrative that an unborn child is named. Ishmael has not been born and he is named. Not only is he named, but he's given one of the Abrahamic promises. The promise to Abraham that is, that is, is that his seed 
would be as the stars, that they would be um, without number, can't be counted. So as the seed of Abraham, Ishmael could receive the literal blessings. He was an inheritor of the literal blessings, but he did not inherit the spiritual blessings. So this is something to keep in mind as we look at Ishmael and, and his progeny. So they did receive literal blessings and they go on to develop a religion that is very much based, I guess, on, um, on, on, the, on the literal. Not the spirit, uh, I shouldn't say not the spiritual, but it is literal. So verse 12, and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. So we understand this wild man to be the wild Arabian ass, the onager, untamable. Um, we're told in Genesis 25, they're sent away to the east, uh, into the east country. And so this begins the, I guess, the tribes of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, hand against every man, so um, contentious, and, but dwells in the presence of all his brethren. So his brethren were who? You can include Isaac with them. So these are our, um, I guess, our, uh, the brothers of God's people, half-brothers. They would dwell in their presence. So as, as brothers, it's, and as just as another person, it's again so important that we do not bear false witness against our brothers. So we have to be very careful that we do not stereotype every descendant of Ishmael. It's very easy to do. It's, it's just a, um, it's easy for the brain to do that. But we have to take the time to think logically and to think um, as God thinks and look at uh, as a, a large group of individuals. And when we say large group, we're talking about a quarter of the world's population. Doesn't pay to uh, misrepresent a, a, a I think, um, uh, I, I think it's 1.6 billion people. Oh, um, correct that if that's wrong. So Ishmael is recognized by Muslims as the ancestor of several Northern Arabian tribes. So what we want to go back is, is go forward now two and a half thousand years. We're going to go visit the nomadic tribes of the Arabian Peninsula. And it's very tribal. Uh, they fight amongst themselves. They look after their own tribe. And your protection is your tribe. Your tribe will look after you because you'll probably be fighting other tribes. It will provide for you. Um, so there's much protection, much care within a tribe. But they're quite contentious against other tribes. There's no real law, no real government that is overarching all these Arabian tribes. They have no formal government. It's a tribal world. It works on revenge and vendettas. Somebody does something wrong, you pay them back, and that just goes on forever. They were polytheistic. They were idol worshippers. Their centre of idolatry uh, was in the city of Mecca. And in the Mecca, there was in the middle of the, there was a big shrine in Mecca uh, and a big, uh, you would see pictures of it today, the big cube that is called the Hajj that they believe that Abraham and Ishmael built. And surrounding that Hajj with about 360 different idols. One of them was Jesus, one of them was Mary, one of them was everything else. If you can think of Mecca, it was the Jewish equivalent of the Pantheon. Every god you could think of was there. Mecca was a, a hub of, um, you know, in that time period of trade. And so, you know, you provided for everybody. So if somebody was coming from whoop whoop, they had whoop whoop God, God there. Somebody was coming from the east or the west or whatever. Everything was there in that one place that you could worship. And people made money out of that. Same story that is told in the New Testament, but a different town. So this is what it was like in, in Mecca in, in the time when Muhammad was, um, was born. So these 
Arabian tribes, they believed in the God of the Christians and the God of the Jews. They believed he was the greatest God and there was no idol for that God. They made idols for every other God, but they did not make an idol of the one true God. But they had had many. So they were polytheistic. They didn't make pictures. So there were no pictures, no idols of the one true God. So we're going to draw a timeline. I think I've got some more room. And we're going to talk about Muhammad. 570 AD, Muhammad is born. Now, uh, Muhammad's father died a couple of months before he was born. So he was wet nursed out to one of the Bedouin tribes, and, uh, which was kind of a dumb thing. The, it was seen to be uh, healthier and safer for a child to be um, brought up for the first couple of years outside the city. Cities were tended to be diseased, uh, not clean places. So you could send your child out to be wet nursed by the Bedouins. And usually you would be returned when you were two. Muhammad stayed out there until he was five. He's finally returned to his mother and his mother has not remarried. And that's unusual. It's unusual for a child to be wet nursed for five years. And it's unusual for a widowed woman to not remarry. Usually within the tribes, that's how they looked after one another. So um, you, your brother or the brother of the deceased or somebody would marry the, 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 this widow. So this hasn't happened in Muhammad's case. So he's returned, but after two years, his mother dies. So in 577, his mother dies and his grandfather takes him. His grandfather doesn't live very long and then his grandfather dies and um, his, uh, his uncle takes him. Now, Muhammad belonged to the Quraysh tribe, which was one of the mo more powerful, wealthy tribes. So even though he was of humble origin, he was still within the Quraysh tribe. So he had um, a fair, fair bit of protection, especially from his unca, uncle, who was a trader. And his uncle got him working on the camels uh, caravanning and taught him how to trade. Muhammad worked himself up slowly and got himself a really good reputation. He had some nicknames, like in, in Arabic, he would be known as the trusted one, um, the truthful one. He, he was a very uh, pious uh, person and earned himself a very good reputation. In... Um, 595, he's 24 years old. He's employed by a uh, wealthy widowed mer merchant called uh, Kadesha. Kadesha. Kad oh, I'm pronouncing her right. Kad Kad Kadesha. Kadesha who employs him to take a train, a ca caravan, um, uh, I think, to Syria. He returns and he's done really well. He brings her back the prophet and she's taken quite a liking to him. And uh, so she asks him to marry her. She's 15 years her, his senior, uh, but uh, Muhammad agrees. So she proposes to Muhammad and they are married for 24 years, a monogamous relationship, very happy. And he continues to work for Khadijah. So Mecca is getting rich um, and the values are, going, uh, are decreasing. Even the values that they had within their tribe are, 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 are lowering because of the wealth of Mecca. Everybody's focused on money making. So... Um, it's not, not as it was earlier. So he's 40 now. We're going to come down to where Muhammad is 40. And this is the year 610.
In between here, he's had um, a number of daughters. He had four daughters. He had uh, two uh, Kadisha. He had a, 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 a young son that died at birth. Uh, so there were only four daughters that survived. Uh, apparently had very good relationship with his daughter, the youngest one being Fatima. So <clears throat> 610, he goes up into the mountains for his yearly pilgrimage to pray and to fast, which he, he did regularly. When we think of the Hajj, when we think of Ramadan and things like that, they, they were cultural practices before the um, introduction of Islam. So Islam just really, um, it, it reformed their uh, normal cultural practices. So he went up into this mountain to pray, something he, he did regularly. As he's up there, the story goes that the angel Gabriel appeared to him. And Gabriel said to him, recite. And he's terrified. And he says, recite what? And the angel keeps repeating to him, recite, recite. And he's saying, I don't know what to recite. And then the angel gives to him the very first words of the Quran. And Quran really just means recitation. So um, he's frightened. Uh, he's told to recite these words. He goes back down to, goes home, runs straight to his wife, uh, puts his head on her lap, says, cover me with your shawl. And she does. And then he tells her what happened. And she says, I think you might be the prophet for this people. And he's really struggling to come to terms with that. He goes to his wife's Christian cousin and tells him, and again, gets confirmed by this Christian, you, your God is speaking through you. These are revelations of God. Uh, you're a prophet. So he struggles with, with th that for a number of years because they're telling him he's a prophet, but no more revelations come. So he just keeps it to, to his um, uh, family. And then after two years, he actually feels quite, uh, he feels like God has abandoned him. And Muhammad understands what abandonment is. So um, you can understand it, it, it you know, Ishmael, <laughs> They, this is something that is deep rooted in them, this feeling of abandonment. And even amongst the Arabian tribes, they were told by Jews and Christians that they were a lost people. You don't have a prophet, you don't have scriptures. You know, you're just nobodies. So anyway, Muhammad feels abandoned. And then again, this angel Gabriel, this uh, revelation appears to him and says, no, we have not forgotten you, Muhammad. And then the revelations continue. And he continues to have many of them from that time period. It takes him about three years to start going public with these revelations. Understand, this is, he is told to recite. In the Arabian world, there is no art. They don't draw, they don't have paintings, they don't have architecture. Their art is their poetry. It is in their writing. So um, even uh, before, before, uh, before there was Islam, the Arabian tribes were known for their poetry. You would sit around the campfire or the oasis and recite poetry. The Quran is lost to us in the English language. In the Arabic, it is seen as very beautiful prose, but it's something we can't really appreciate in our language. It's much the same as taking Shakespeare and putting it into French. It just doesn't make sense. The same with the Quran when you put it into English. We don't see the beauty of it. Much, I guess, why people probably wouldn't see the beauty of the King James Version, which we love. So, their art is their poetry. So how he spread this message was going around reciting. He would recite these, uh, the Quran, the verses that were given to him by the angel Gabriel. And that's how he evangelized. So 613, he starts to go public. Six fourteen. Persecution. Because what is he going public? What is the message that he's giving to them? 
There is only one God, only one true God. And what is in Mecca? Many gods. They're polytheistic. So what he is doing is striking at the very heart of their economy, of their, uh, their nationalism, their, you know, of who they were. He's um, threatening their livelihoods uh, and their jobs. So he starts to get persecution. He also starts to get a following. So he's got a rather small following, but these people, as they grow, they start getting heavily persecuted and they're beaten. They're, um, some are crucified. Crucifixion wasn't just something the Romans did. Uh, he was beaten. He was jailed. About a year later, a lot of them fled to Ethiopia. So um, this is harsh persecution by the Meccans. Um, 6.19. 6.19 is called his year of sorrows because it's the year that Hadijah dies. Not only does Hadijah die, but his uncle dies. Now he's in trouble because his uncle was his protector because he did belong to this uh, powerful tribe. And having his uncle alive gave him certain amount of protection. Hadisha was a wealthy woman. She could still work and provide. Understand people stopped actually working and giving Muhammad business. So his livelihood was lost. But at least he had his wife uh, could look after him and his uncle. So they die and this is a year of sorrows. Um, so... His message is one not just of ridding the, uh, the, the, the city of idols, but it's also one of social justice, which is why he attracted a lot of the poor and the underclasses, people that weren't of the Quraysh tribe. Uh, it didn't make him popular. He was arguing against greed, corruption, uh, the basic running of the city. He, he uh, was um, encouraging them to care for the needy, for the orphaned, for the widows, the things that they used to do as tribes that they had stopped doing. So in 620, he has, this is a famous vision that he purports to have had where he um, is taken up to heaven and he gets to meet all the other prophets and liaises with um, Moses. So that's in 620. Okay. Again, the uh, persecution continues. 622, about 600 kilometres northwest of Mecca is a town called uh, Yathrib. Yathrib is basically an oasis, but the tribes around there were really in turmoil. They were fighting amongst each other, a lot of um, bad stuff going on in Yathrib. A couple of the people from there were pilgrimages, uh, having a pilgrimage to Mecca. And during that pilgrimage, they came across Muhammad. And Muhammad, he's sharing his message. And they, they are entranced by this message and think, oh, wow, think you better come back to our place. There's some problems that we, um, you, need, you could sort out for us. And they said, you come back, we'll protect you. So he decides he will flee Mecca. It's not an easy thing to do because the Meccans don't trust him. So he sends his family and his friends and his followers out in the middle of the night. He stays behind. When they're safe, then he goes and he flees to Yathrib. Yathrib today is Medina. Once he's there, and I'll write this, this is the night flight to Medina. He starts preaching or reciting his message of social justice they make him governor. So now he's not just a religious leader, he is a civil leader, he's a governor of this town. And he sorts all their problems out and not only do all the tribes convert to Islam, 
They, oh, the surrounding tribes, a lot of the tribes around Arabia also convert. So he has many followers. That's a problem because the people in Mecca think he's just amassing a great army. He's going to come. He's going to wipe him out. And they just see him as trouble that they need to get rid of. And so you see 623, 624, there's these wars where Mecca keeps coming against Medina to try and fight against them. So um, there's, then they, they call them battles, but really they're just skirmishes. Uh, all the time that Muhammad is in Mecca, the revelations that are coming to him are saying, take your persecution, do not fight back, do not retaliate. Once he is ruler in Medina, the revelations change. And now he is told that, yes, you can fight, but there are conditions. You're, so violence was not mandated, but it was allowed under certain conditions. So the messages change. And clerics uh, and uh, Muslim um, academics and theologians understand that to understand the Quran, you have to take it in historical context. So they look at his early, early um, uh, recitations and they understand that in its context when, it was, when he was in Mecca and also when the difference between that and Medina. So a context is very important to an uh, Islamic theologian. So in Medina, um, he's looking after these people. He's got huge responsibility. So now violence is allowed, permitted. Now, it's, you still need to go to Mecca to uh, go on pilgrimage. So what they do in um, 628 Is he and about 10,000 um, uh, of the tribes, they start marching on Mecca. They want to go to pilgrimage. The Meccans come out, meet him and say, look, let's make a treaty. Let's make peace. Don't come on pilgrimage this year. You come back next year and we'll let you do it. So they said, oh, OK. So they agreed to this treaty. They went back. The next year, so 628 was the treaty. It's got a name, but I. It was a, supposed to be a 10 year treaty. The next year, 629, they come back and the Meccans come out and say, no, not this year, next year. They broke the treaty. So Muhammad and his followers go back, they talk about it, and they say, we're going to Mecca. So in 630, they all march on Mecca. The Meccans come out and basically surrender. They conquer Mecca. They conquer Mecca and there's not one ounce of blood that is shed. Muhammad goes in. He cleans up all the idols. He uh, reorganises um, the city. Those that were his bitterest enemies, he replaces them in uh, positions of authority, in administrative positions, sets it all in order, and everybody converts to Islam, and he goes back to Medina, where he dies two years later in 632. So what we see here is what Muhammad did, he did what he does best, and that was he negotiated. He was a politician. Nobody wanted war. Nobody wanted to fight. Understand under the old tribal laws, he had every right to have gone into Mecca and just killed them all. And that's what they were expecting. And he did the very opposite. It's interesting, when the Meccans surrendered, one of his followers said, as they were about to march into Mecca, he, he said, um, what if they attack us. Not everybody wants, is welcoming us in Mecca. What if they attack us? Muhammad says, 
you may kill the unbelievers. But when we read this in context, so this is one of those Quranic verses that gets quoted a lot. You may kill the unbelievers. Now understand what, in a historical context, what an unbeliever was. An unbeliever was a polytheistic Meccan. An unbeliever was not a Jew or not a Christian. So in Medina, there were Jews and there were Christians. Nobody was forced, there was no forced conversions. You were allowed to be whatever religion you wanted to be. Understand that if you lived in Medina, you had to pay a tax if you weren't a Muslim, but you were allowed to keep your own religion. Muhammad was pluralistic because what they believed was that Jews and Christians were people of the book, that the Quran, these revelations were just an extension of the Old Testament and then the New Testament, and these were further revelations. You understand, I'm, I'm giving you the, world, the their understanding of their... Um, I think the best way to understand a people is to uh, not, not project our understanding on them, but the way they see it. So this is the way they see it, is that they are an extension of the people of the book. So Jews and Christians were never considered unbelievers. Polytheistic Meccans were unbelievers. So... so uh, Muhammad says, you can kill unbelievers. And then he says, but only if they attack you first and only if they stop you reaching the shrine and only if the truce we now have falls through and only if no other truce is in place or can be negotiated, then you may. So basically it was, yes, you can, but it's better if you don't. And that is the subtext of, the, of that, um, of that uh, mandate. So, um, so he marches into Mecca, he doesn't take the throne. What he does is he sets it in order and then he goes back to Medina. And as I said, he dies uh, a couple of years later. So he was a master negotiator. In 22 years, he'd pretty much conquered all of the Arabian Peninsula. Everybody there was um, uh, now Muslim. And uh, we talked last week about what the word Muslim means. What does the word Muslim mean? It means submit or surrender. So, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> the word Islam, the Islam means submit or surrender. A Muslim is just somebody who has submitted or surrendered to the one true God, the one, uh, the, 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 the one God. So that's their, their main, um, I guess the, the force of their message is there is only one God and you must surrender to that one God. We understand that every religion has a perception of what is wrong with the world and provides what they think is the answer or the solution to what is wrong with the world. And what, what, uh, what Muhammad perceived as being wrong with the world is that people weren't surrendered to God. People were self-sufficient. This is what had happened in Mecca. As long as you had a job and your money, you didn't really need God. God was, you know, uh, on the periphery. So he wanted God to be number one. It has to be number one in your life. When God isn't number one in your life, you replace it with an idol. So that's why they are against idol worship, worshippers or worshipping. So no idols because you are submitted to one God. So whether that idol is your wealth or your, um, uh, um, you know, something, a graven image, uh, anything, uh, it, it, the, the whole purpose of Islam was to take you back to worship God as a priority in your life. So I just want to take a minute to talk about Muhammad's wives. He was married to Adija for 24 years. 
uh, he had his children to Adisha. When he uh, passed away, he then remarried Aisha. Aisha was the young daughter of Abba Bakar. Abba Bakar was one of his companions. You remember from Abba Bakar from Revelation chapter 9, he was the one who made the decree about don't touch those that uh, have the seal of God. So that Abba Bakar, he married his daughter very young. He married other wives. He had 11 wives in total, but the other nine wives were widows. He had no children to them. And this is what you did. The, you, you took in widows, you brought them into your household. That is the way they were provided for. Uh, he was... Um, So we might just talk a little bit about his, uh, and I'll just share the screen. So here's a, a map of Saudi Arabia where you can see where Mecca is and Medina is uh, just slightly northwest of Mecca. He you, you united all of those Arabian tribes within 22 years. This is his family tree. You can see Kadisha, his first wife, and Aisha, his second wife, who was a daughter of Abba Bakar. The point of this uh, graph is I just want to show you that his youngest daughter, Fatima, married his cousin, Ali. Ali was the son of this uncle that took Muhammad on and uh, trained him and helped him and provided, uh, protected him. So Ali was his cousin and his cousin married his youngest daughter Fatima. They had these children and Hassan and Hussein become very important in the, um, in the history of, uh, so, and does, as does Ali. Ali is considered a blood relative of Muhammad and he's considered, his progeny is considered very important in Islamic history. So I'm just going to come down here. There are five main pillars or core beliefs in the practices of Islam. The first is their profession of faith called the Shahada. This is where they say there is no God but God. Muhammad is the messenger of God. This is central to Islam. So if you converted to Islam, you would walk into a mosque with your friends, you would recite this, I can't remember, three or seven times in somebody's presence and you were considered a convert. So this is your profession of faith. The next pillar is prayer, the praying to God of five times a day. Again, it's because they uh, want you to uh, put God, pri prioritize God in your life, surrender to God. So you actually stop to put God first at those particular times of day. Arms, charity, they have to pay 2.5% of their total wealth to charity, to the poor. That's the sakat. And that is not, um, so that is not, uh, of your income, that is of your total wealth. So you would add up, you know, your house and your car and everything. And that goes directly to the poor. It doesn't go to an imam. It doesn't go to a mosque. It doesn't pay for carpet on a church floor. It pays, it goes straight to the poor. You can hand it straight to the poor. You can give it to any charity and it can go to any religion. Doesn't matter about the religion. Doesn't matter about the country as long as it goes to the poor. Then there is the fasting, which we talked about that and Ramadan. Again, the idea is that you uh, prioritise God and then the pilgrimage to the Hajj. So everybody is expected to get to Mecca once a year, sorry, sorry, once in a lifetime. If you are uh, physically able to do it, if you are financially able to do it, so there are conditions on that need to get to, uh, to, to go on pilgrimage. Uh, if you're not well enough, if you're not financial enough, if you cannot provide for your family while you go on pilgrimage, you are not to go. Our next slide, I want to show you the difference between Sunni Islam and Shia Islam. So when Muhammad was on his deathbed, his family were off 
organising the funeral, in preparation for the funeral. They knew he was going to die. While the family were away, his companions got together and decided who would replace him as political leader, not as a religious leader, but as a political leader. And the first replacement was this Abba Bakar that we know well of from uh, Revelation chapter 9. So Abba Bakar replaces him and then he only lives two more years. Umar replaces him who is assassinated. Uthman or Osman replaces him who is assassin assassinated. And then he is replaced by Ali. Ali is Muhammad's blood uh, cousin. So the difference between Sunni and Islam is that they disagree over who should have replaced Muhammad. The Sunni Islam says it should have been his companions, that this, these four first caliphs are called the Rashidun caliphs. So they are honoured. With Shia Islam, they, they see these first three as usurpers, that they were not... Um, uh, not legal uh, followers of uh, Muhammad. And the first caliph, the first replacement should have been Ali. And so this is where the split between Sunni and Shia Islams come from. There was some war in that time. This is known as the first fitna or the first civil war. A fitna is a time of, of distress and sorrow so that nobody's happy to be warring over this. It gets settled and pretty much Sunni and Shia Islam live together peacefully. They work it out for hundreds of years until 1979 and uh, we see Iran and Saudi Arabia who were once allies become rivals and we see this Sunni and Shia split again. But for many hundreds of years they lived quite happily together. Uh, so we'll come back to that. So um, the other date I want to put up is um, 6.37, I think it's 6.37. And this is when they take Jerusalem. So after the life of Muhammad, the religion of Islam spreads and it's only a few short years before they've got the, not only the whole peninsula but the Levant, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the whole Middle East and they've got this uh, Jerusalem in 637. Now understand that in Jerusalem there are Jews and Christians and Muslims and they all live together. You know, it's not Shangri-La or it's not paradise but everybody's getting on. You could live in Jerusalem, you could go to pilgrimage to Jerusalem if you were a Catholic, uh, uh, Christian, as long as you paid your taxes, as long as you paid uh, the, um, uh, what's it called? But it, basically it's a, it's a tax and they, they, they live together. So understand that Islam is not a pacifist religion. It, it doesn't um, condone violence, but it allows violence. Muhammad himself was not uh, considered a violent man. He was actually quite progressive when it came to women. He uh, mandated that women should be educated. His second wife, Aisha, was very highly trained and took leadership positions, not only in religious matters, but also in state matters. Uh, so he believed in the education of, of, of girls. He uh, brought in laws that um, stopped infant infanticide for girls because they were still killing girl babies if they just wanted uh, boys. He put a stop to that. Um, he, he, what he brought in was that women should receive an inheritance. So he made it legal for them to receive an inheritance, which may, meant that they could go on and own property and run their own businesses. So where the, now in the Quran is, has the verses that are not 
uh, pro-women in much the same way as if you went to verses in the New Testament or the Old Testament. So they're still hemmed in by their, you know, 6th century patriarchal ideas, 7th century patriarchal ideas. But there was some progressiveness. The idea of the hijab and the burqa, that came in many generations later. It's Persian culture that imposed itself on the Islam religion. But it was not considered Islamic in the time of Muhammad. You won't find it in the Quran. So, um, so Jerusalem was taken by Islam for 637, 637 AD. So we're going to come down till when? 637 to the year 1099. The year 1099 is the year of the First Crusade. When Pope Urban II in France gave a speech and said, let's go over to the Holy Land and let's get the, the, the Holy City and the Holy Land back for God. I'll just put up another picture. So here's a map. It's a bit um, blurry. I'll just make it a bit larger. But you can basically see that that's a map of Europe and the, the Northern Africa and the Middle East. And all that olive green is in, in uh, the time of the First Crusade is what is conquered by Islam. So it's got the bottom of Spain, Portugal and North Africa and all of this in the Middle East. This yellow is the what is not was known as the latin church the church of rome the pink is the orthodox church the greek orthodox church so there's been a split in the latin church so you've got the church of rome and you've got the orthodox church the orthodox church have sent word over to um, their western brothers and said can you give us a hand because we're being um you know, we've got some trouble here on our, on our east. And so this is where Pope Urban II says, OK, we're not only going to give you a hand, but we're going to get back all that territory. So he has a, a sort of a double um, uh, um, few reasons why he decides to call for this holy war to get back all this territory over here. Uh, one of them is also that he's not doing too well over where he is and this is a distraction. Let's get everybody focused on war over there so you can't see the problems I've got here. So it was a major distraction and he sent everybody warring over here. Problem is uh, some of them left a bit too early so they're arriving in that area around spring, there's nothing to eat so they're just pillaging villages, killing Jews on the way People are going, but they're not necessarily soldiers. They're poor people. They're not organized. So it's really a mess, these uh, early crusades. So eventually, the first uh, army arrives in Jerusalem in uh, 1099. And basically what they did was kill everybody. In two days... It, uh, they are uh, said to have killed 30,000 people. Up, anything up to 70,000 people were killed in that first war against Jerusalem in 1099 by these Christ, so-called Christian crusaders. Uh, they killed Jews, they killed Muslims. And they, um, apparently the city stunk for months. And then they took over this area. At the 88 years later, the Muslims start to uh, get a bit more organised as armies and decide that they're going to fight back. They actually didn't fight back for quite some time. There's a, um, there is a, we come, come down to the, 
year 1187. And there is a sultan called Saladan. Now, I spoke of him last week, but a, a brother, Brother Chris, sent me um, some information, more information on him. And I thought this was a really good read. So I'm just going to share this with you quickly about Saladan. Saladan was known for his generosity, his piety. He was devoid of fanaticism. During the European conquest of Jerusalem in 1099, the European Christian crusaders slaughtered Muslims, Jews and fellow Christians who were not European like them. So they slaughtered the Christians too if they weren't white Europeans. They raped women and smashed babies against walls in a brutal and barbaric raid over the Holy Lands. 88 years later, when Sultan Salah Salahuddin defeated the Crusaders and entered Jerusalem, the city's Christians feared for their lives and were absolutely certain that the Muslims would avenge the injustices suffered upon them when the Christian Crusaders captured the city. Monks began to conceal their treasures and holy scriptures for fear of looting, while terrified Christian mothers shaved their daughters' heads in an attempt to disguise them as boys so that they would not be raped as had been the case with Muslim girls when the Christians took over Jerusalem. They were projecting their mentality onto the Muslim army that came to liberate the holy city. If we did that to them, they will definitely do that same to us. When Sultan Saladin entered Jerusalem as the victor, he ordered that no Christians should be killed in retaliation. Children, widows and the elderly were not only spared their lives, but Saladin ordered that they should not be taken into captivity and sold as slaves, which would have been perfectly justified considering the fact that taking captives into slavery was the universal convention of the day. Instead, he let them continue with their lives and did not inflict their families with any cause for concern. Additionally, the Sultan granted all Christians, pilgrims and merchants from foreign lands the opportunity to return home safely and without fear of being harmed or taken captive by his forces. They were also permitted to take all their property with them. As there were some women and children among these people, Saladin made sure that they were reunited with their male relatives so that they would not be harassed or harmed on the journey home. As for Eastern Christians, who were native to the city, Saladin granted them permanent rights to stay in their homes and neighbourhoods, while also reinstating the right of every Jew to visit and resettle in Jerusalem after they were banished and persecuted by the Christian Crusaders. He conquered Jerusalem on a Saturday and ordered that the churches be open on Sunday for services. He then ordered for the places of worship to be purified as the crusaders had left feces and filth all over the place while converting some places of worship into horse stables. Saladin participated in this task by taking rose water and scrubbing the floor of the, of the mosque with his own hands. His soldiers followed his example and they spent an entire week washing and cleaning the filth that was left on Jerusalem's streets and buildings. When they were done, Jerusalem was purified and the sweet aroma of roses could be smelled everywhere. So that just paints a totally different picture of the barbaric Muslims that the Christian crusaders were rising up to fight against in this time period. So where we get these caricatured stereotypes of Muslims being, you know, barbarians and, um, you know, uh, child killers and, and even the Jews as being child killers is propaganda that all came out of these crusades. Now, there were many crusades. History kind of gives us basically four, but for about two, three hundred years, there were lots of crusades. Those crusades were not just against Muslims. They were against Jews. They were against other Christians. So wars even in the West that uh, were against the Albigenses, uh, they were considered a crusade as well. So they went after anybody. Um, and 
in doing that, they, it, they gan, gathered the people for these armies based on propaganda of what the projection that they were placing on these minority, on these um, uh, foreign people, whether it was Jews or Muslims, they, they kind of boxed them all together. So uh, history tells us there, there was good and bad on both sides, but it, it, uh, it's not all as we see. Um, there's m many good reports of, and I mean, even during these crusades, they did a lot of, tra still did a lot of trading and working together. Sometimes Muslims actually went and were mercenaries and went and fought on the side of the Christians and vice versa. So it was really quite a, a messy time period. It's not, the crusades aren't that easy to understand. So when we think of these crusades, we come down to 2001. Two thousand and one, and George Bush stood on the front lawn of the White House, and he said, "We are now starting a crusade." I should um, quote him properly. Um, he called it. Let me see if I can pull this up. I'll just read um, a portion of it to you. I'm just going to read the first four paragraphs. This is a speech delivered on June 4, 2009. June 4. And President Obama says, I am honoured to be in the timeless city of Cairo and to be hosted by two remarkable institutions. For over a thousand years, Al-Azhar has stood as a beacon of Islamic learning and for over a century, Cairo University has been a source of Egypt's advancement. Together, you represent the harmony between tradition and progress. I am grateful for your hospitality and the hospitality of the people of Egypt. I am also proud to carry with me the goodwill of the American people and a greeting of peace from Muslim communities in my country. A salamu alaikim, which is peace be unto you. We meet at a time of tension between the United States and Muslims around the world. Tension rooted in historical forces that go beyond any current policy debate. The relationship between Islam and the West includes centuries of coexistence and cooperation, but also conflict and religious wars. More recently, tension has been fed by colonialism that denied rights and opportunities to many Muslims and a Cold War in which Muslim-majority countries were too often treated as proxies without regard to their own aspirations. Moreover, the sweeping change brought by modernity and globalisation led many Muslims to view the West as hostile to the traditions of Islam. Violent extremists have exploited these tensions in a small but potent minority of Muslims. The attacks of September 11, 2001, and the continued efforts of these extremists to engage in violence against civilians has led some in my country to view Islam as inevitably hostile, not only to America and Western countries, but also to human rights. This has bred more fear and mistrust. So long as our relationship is defined by our differences, we will empower those who sow hatred rather than peace and who promote conflict rather than the cooperation that can help all of our people achieve justice and prosperity. This cycle of suspicion and discord must end. I have come here to seek a new beginning between the United States and Muslims around the world. So this speech was entitled, A New Beginning. And this set the tone for uh, Obama's um, work with the Middle East at the beginning of his presidency. This is, um, this is his first year. And then we see in 2012, Obama now uh, stands before the, um, uh, the UN General, United Nations General Assembly 
and he gives a speech on September 25. And I'll just read the portion of the speech that most upset the Protestant uh, Christians in, in America. He said, the future must not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam. Now, I'm just going to also read that in context. He says, the future, she sa he says, it is time to leave the call of violence and politics of division behind. On so many issues, we face a choice between the promise of the future or the prisons of the past, and we cannot afford to get it wrong. We must seize this moment and America stands ready to work with all who are willing to embrace a better future. The future must not belong to those who target Coptic Christians in Egypt. It must be claimed by those in Tahir Square who chanted, Muslims, Christians, we are one. The future must not belong to those who bully women. It must be shaped by girls who go to school and those who stand for a world where our daughters can live their dreams just like our sons. At that point, the, United Na the Assembly rose and, and applauded him. The future must not belong to those corrupt few who steal a country's resources. It must be won by the students and entrepreneurs, the workers and business owners who seek a broader prosperity for all people. Those are the women and men that America stands with. Theirs is the vision we will support. The future must not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam. But to be credible, those who condemn that slander must also condemn the hate we see in the images of Jesus Christ that are desecrated or the churches that are destroyed, or the Holocaust that is denied. So I just wanted to place that. He says, oh, also, let us condemn incitement against Sufi Muslims and Shiite pilgrims. And then he goes on to quote Gandhi about tolerance. So the next speech that I want to refer to is one, a press statement that he released in 2014. And this is September 10. So this one was to the United Nations. This one's to the United States. And uh, for time, I won't read much of it, but in paragraph four, he says, um, now let's make two things clear. ISIL is not Islamic. No religion condones the killing of innocents. And the vast majority of ISIL's victims have been Muslim. And ISIL is certainly not a state. It was formerly Al-Qaeda's affiliate in Iraq and has taken advantage of sectarian strife and Syria's civil war to gain victory on both sides of the Iraq-Syrian border. So he goes on to talk about Iraq. This statement here that ISIL is not Islamic had the Fox News and the Protestant world in, uh, the, uh, in, in um, foaming at the mouth. So the point of this is that during this time period here, between 2001 and 2014, which we know had our increase of knowledge internally for us, it was a message that was going to give us time that during this time period here, we know that the world isn't being ploughed. When we line up our lines, as Brother John did this morning, when we look at the line of the Nethanims, during 2001 to 2014, this is a period that was also, um, we should have been learning from as well, that we could have been listening to. That Barack Obama was also speaking to us to make sure that when we understood the prophecy of 2001 and what happened at 9-11, that we have that in, in, in the, uh, connect that um, the right way with our, with our understanding of the Muslim people.
Sorry, does that help? So we have much to learn from just considering these speeches of Barack Obama. When we look at our line here, what, um, what Adventist, Adventism took from Protestant thinking, they immersed themselves in for 126 years and we now have to come out of that thinking. It's been a progressive work to come out of those um, uh, prejudiced, bigoted thoughts, whether it's racism, sexism, homophobia or xenophobia, all these thoughts that we've had, uh, the misconceptions that we may have had towards Muslim and, uh, and Islam also need to be corrected. We need to be able to not bear false witness against our brethren, against another person. That does not mean that we look at their religion as being, as, as being uh, legitimate. Uh, we understand that these are counterfeit religions, but we need to look at each person as individual and that uh, the characters or the, um, that we may have held misunderstandings of just what their religion represented. Christianity has some things wrong with it. That's what has developed extreme uh, right-wing Christian views. But we understand it has the core of truth and, and the reform line is about bringing out that truth, letting go of the error and letting tr truth um, evolve, light come in and dispel any darkness. As that light dispels darkness, it should also dispel our uh, erroneous thinkings on other human beings. So um, when we think that there are 1.8 billion Muslims in the world, it's the second largest religion, that the majority of the people that are going to make up the, the, the great mountain at the end of the world will be not those of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They will come out of the greatest darkness. And uh, so we need to have these people in, in a correct view. So we'll finish there for time. There's much more that could be said about Islam. Uh, it is a fascinating uh, uh, history to, to look into, just to have a, um, an overview of, of how they developed and, and who they are and what the majority of the people believe. Uh, I guess one thing I'd like to add is that they, when they look at the Quran, much the same as when we look at the Bible, they believe that there's certain rules that have to be used, that there's a methodology. Their methodology involves historical context and also bringing in all the verses that speak to a particular subject. So if somebody like uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, Khomeini uh, issues a fatwa like he did in 1989 on Salman Rushdie, it is seen as an illegal fatwa because in order to be legal, it has to have the consensus of the whole Muslim world. They do not have an overriding cleric like a pope. For them to issue a fatwa, Fatwa, it has to be a consensus of the whole Muslim world. So uh, academics and theologians and lawyers will get together and come to a decision together. So no one individual, whether it was Ayatollah Khomeini or Osama bin Laden, can issue a fatwa. So those are extreme positions by a minority group. So there are certain things we should understand about how their religion works. It just doesn't work like one person can come out and issue a fatwa like that. Um, and also the understanding of jihad. Jihad does not mean holy war. It means struggle. So Muhammad talked about the lesser jihad and the greater jihad. The greater jihad is our struggle with sin. It's an inward struggle. The lesser jihad is the outward struggle. It can involve violence, but not always. That's not the norm. It involves anything where we come into contact with our external world and we're struggling. So it can be financial, 
uh, struggle. It can be um, physical struggle. But he emphasised the greater jihad over the lesser jihad. And as Christians, we should have a... Um, we, sh we should be able to relate to that as well. Internal struggle is the greater struggle than the external struggle. So, so many things that he taught that um, as a counterfeit, we understand that it comes from somewhere. You know, these are borrowed thoughts, uh, but at the same time that they're not necessarily wrong thoughts unless you deny the one um, uh, Jesus Christ as your, uh, as God. And that's, um, you know, the downfall of the, the Muslim religion. So um, on that note, we'll, we'll finish and uh, we'll close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you, dear God, that you see men not as we see, but you see every soul made in your creation and in your image. Lord, we pray for your mind where we would not esteem others, um, that we would esteem others better than ourselves. Lord, we have a great work to do for people of all uh, persuasions. So please help us to uh, rid our minds of any false witness. We pray for uh, an understanding of this increase of knowledge as it's coming to us through our leaders that uh, whatever it is that we need to put aside, may we be prepared to do that so that we can face the final test and, and not fall. I thank you, Lord, for your wonderful love in sending a, your son. We understand that he is the son of God, that, uh, that, we, um, that his life and his death and his resurrection and his ministry offers us so much more and others are, are missing out on that wonderful revelation. We pray that we would be able to share that, that it would be um, made manifest, not only in how we speak it, but how we live that surrendered life to you and to your son. And so as we uh, leave now and prepare for the, uh, the rest of the Sabbath day, we ask that you continue to be with us and that you would bless those that aren't with us this morning. Again, Lord, I lift up the Colner family to you. Please help them with their needs and Father, do not leave us until you bless us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.